Hello YouTube, Mark McRae here from InAxis. Today I'd like to talk to you guys about uh, how to connect a 360 degree storm camera and what would be the most common settings that you might have in a 360 degree storm camera. So I have a setup here which includes a camera that has been temporarily installed on the ceiling of our training room. Um, I have a little PoE switch. I've connected my laptop to the small PoE switch and now I'd like to show you exactly what settings you would have if you were to connect inside the camera uh, through the web page of the camera, the IP address of the camera and then afterwards we're going to be uh, using this camera in another video concerning uh, our archive our video management software. So uh, the default IP address of this camera is 192.168.1.108. So I will connect initially. I'm recording my screen at the same time. So I'm going to connect to 192.168.1.108. Enter. And on the initial login of that IP address, it's going to ask me what country I'm in. So I'm going to choose Canada. So I simply type Canada. It's going to ask me what language. I'll say English and what video standard between NTSC and PAL. And I'll choose NTSC because we're in Canada. Uh, it's also now going to ask me what date format I'd like to have. I'll synchronize from my PC so I don't have to go acquire any date format or type anything. I could just say uh, my, my PC is going to give the camera the date format. I'll do next. Now it's going to ask me a username and password. The initial username is admin. This is the admin account I'm going to connect to. I'm going to put a password of admin256, something that we use often, and it's easy for me to remember. Admin256, uh, sorry, whoop. admin256. Um, I will not put any email address in here. I don't want to get any updates. Um, let me just uncheck the email, doing next. And now my deny device has now been initialized. Uh, it's asking me if I want to connect peer-to-peer -peer using a DVR. I'm not going to do it at this time. I'm not going to use a Storm DVR. What I'm going to do is connect with archive software a little bit later. So I'm not going to use a Storm DVR. I'm going to do next. It's asking me to auto check for updates. This camera does not have access to internet, so there's no purpose to check for updates right now. Uh, but if the camera did have access to, to, to internet, it could actually check for updates automatically on the firmware. All right? Uh, it logs me out. Next, I'm going to type in the password, which was admin, and uh, the username admin and my password admin256. I'm going to log into the camera. And then it shows me the initial 360 degree hemispheric view of the camera. So um, it's not what I want to do initially. What I would like to do right away is change some settings uh, on this camera. So I'm going to go to the settings tab. And in the setting tabs, the first thing I will see is conditions. Uh, initially, it's not what I want to change. I'm going to want to change the video conditions of the camera. Uh, the encoding mode is one that concerns us uh, mostly. By default, this camera is in H.264 mode. I will modify this from H.264 to H.265, which is a Kodak that is much more efficient than H.264. The resolution of this camera, it is a 5 megapixel resolution, this camera, so I'm going to leave it at its highest resolution. The frame rate uh, it's suggesting is 30 frames per second. I'm going to leave that at 30 frames per second, uh, but it can go all the way down to one frame per second if we'd like, but I'd like it as fluid, uh, fluid as possible. I'll leave it at 30 frames per second. And my bit rate type is quite important also. Uh, instead of leaving it at a constant bit rate, I'm going to change it to a variable bit rate. And if I choose a variable bit rate, the bit rate or the throughput from the camera to the DVR will be modified depending on the activity in the scene and the complexity of the scene. Um, and and uh, in most cases, this is a big advantage. Uh, so in, in a very simple scene, it will use less bandwidth. And in a complex, busy scene, we'll use more bandwidth, uh, but it'll adjust automatically. The camera will adjust automatically. And there's definitely savings that you can do in bandwidth and storage in that case. I'm also going to choose the highest quality. I'm going to go from four to six just to show what, what's possible with the camera. And uh, the cameras have a very interesting uh, possibility is that you can actually set a cap 
to the bit rate in these cameras, so which is called the max bit rate. And by default, it's sh suggesting 3072 uh, kilobits per second. I'm actually going to change that up a little bit. I'll, I'll put 4096. Uh, and then I save. I simply save this. Okay. This should give me a very interesting uh, quality, a good quality of image, uh, and uh, quite good frame rate of 30 frames uh, uh, per second on, on uh, the cameras. I'll also want to remove a few things that are there by default. Um, primarily would be the channel title. Um, it, is, it is there and we call it IPC or IP camera. I'm going to disable that so be sure it doesn't show up on inside of archive because I don't need it. I'll also remove the time title because archive does not need that either. Archive has its own time titles. Okay, I'll just press save here. And, uh, and now I've completed what I wanted to do inside of this, is this camera. Now, something you might want to do also would be to go under networking and change the IP address of this camera, which would be a, 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 a very common thing. Then you would go to network TCP IP. And I've chosen that this camera have a static IP address of 192.168.1.108, which is the default of this camera. But sometimes you want, might want to go DHCP, uh, where the router of the, the site would assign the IP address for this camera, or leave it in a static IP address, uh, but choose something other than the default 192.168.1.108 uh, on the system. In my case here, one camera, one machine, I'm going to leave it at the default. What I'd like to explain now is resolution when it comes to hemispheric or 360 degree cameras. So this camera that we have that we're, we're going to be programming and using is a 5 megapixel hemispheric camera. So a 5 megapixel camera. That means there are 5 million pixels in the field of view of the camera. Now if we take a look at the specification sheet, I'm going to go back to my laptop and show the spec sheet of the camera. If we take a look at the spec sheet of the camera, we can see that this camera is 2,592 times 1,944. 2,592 times 1,944 pixels. So 2,592 to 1944, multiply these two, comes out to 5 million pixels. So 5 megapixels. But what happens is a 360 degree camera, so 2,592, 2,592 times 1,944, 2,592 horizontal to 1,944 vertical, um, that's the resolution of the entire scene or, 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 or the, the theoretical possibility. But that's not what a 360 degree camera has. It's got a round view, a round lens. And the lens actually is occupying this space inside, like that. So what happens is, and actually probably would touch bad drawing, but what happens is this space here, this here, this here, and that there is lost space. So really a five megapixel, you can assume that there's 20%, about 20% of this field of view that is lost. It's just simply black space because five megapixel is a rectangle. It's 2592 times 1944, but the actual image is a circle inside of that. So there is lost resolution about 20% that is just black space. It's not actually recording that. Okay, that's number one. Number two, a, a 360 degree camera. You cannot, when you're looking at a subject in the field or, or an item inside of the field of view, think that on that item you have five megapixels. First of all, we already said that we're down by maybe 20%. So we're at four megapixels, let's say. But inside, this is a, a, an unlimited field of view inside the camera. One. Two, a regular camera would typically have a, a, a field of view of about 90 degrees, let's say. Okay, so 90 degrees. So let's say you were comparing it to a 5 megapixel camera with 90 degrees. Well, this is 180 degrees. So if I say 90 degrees, I split it by four. So in this space right here, I would have 5 megapixels, let's say with a dome or a turret camera or a bullet camera. I'd have 5 megapixels, for 90 degrees of field of view. 
but that's not what I have here. I have five megapixels for 180. So what is my real usable amount of pixels that I have in the 90 degree area to compare to a regular camera? Well, in reality, if I say my five became four because of my dead spaces, so now I only have four megapixels and I split it by four, I have one megapixel left inside of a 90 degree area. In that area, I only have one megapixel left. So in essence, a five megapixel hemispheric camera becomes a one megapixel camera with a fixed lens in a 90 degree field of view. All right? So that's, a, that's point number two. So the understanding of here is a five megapixel hemispheric camera is an overview camera. It's not an identification camera unless the subject is very close to the camera. Oftentimes, all these cameras are installed on ceilings. Right? That's the most common installation of a hemispheric camera. Ceilings is very high. You might have ceilings that might be you know, from 8 feet all the way up to 16 feet high oftentimes in a warehouse, maybe even higher than that. So if you have this camera installed at 16 feet high as an overview, so imagine that you're starting at 16 feet away if the subject is right below, but maybe he's 20 feet away. Maybe it's a 25 foot at a one megapixel, okay? So you're not gonna get the resolution that you think you might get off of a five megapixel camera. Hemispheric cameras are truly overview cameras. They are not identification cameras. Another thing, so this is what the scene would look like inside of the video management software. So let's, took, let's take a look at a physical installation where this might be the ceiling and the camera's installed on a ceiling. What it has is an, a practical unlimited field of view. So what it's seeing actually is almost seeing the ceiling tiles like that and then sees everything, everything, everything underneath like that, okay? So on top of having a, a 360 degree field of view, that is its horizontal field of view, well its vertical field of view is also unlimited. And there's some lost pixels there also that are not really usable. If you look at a regular camera, let's say a dome camera that's installed in a corner, it will have a 90 degree horizontal, but it will also have a limitation, probably something like this, the exact number of degrees, perhaps, it depends on the camera, but let's say a 60 degree uh, field of view uh, vertically with a 90 degree field of view horizontally. But that's not what it has on a 360. It actually sees all the way around. It, it, if you put it in the corner, it'll actually see the wall here and it'll see the wall here easily. Uh, 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 most of the view will be the wall. So you got to consider that when you're comparing it to a five megapixel camera, which is a regular camera, a turret or a dome or a bullet camera, looking at a subject that has five million pixels, looking directly at a subject. That's not what a hemispheric camera, is, camera has. It has a smaller than one megapixel actually because its horizontal and vertical field of views are unlimited, okay? So if that's understood, if you can understand that, then you understand the value and how to apply a 360 degree camera. It is a specialty camera that's used absolutely for overview, you can't hide from this camera. But if you're trying to identify people, faces and things, um, perhaps you need a, a, a 360 degree hemispheric camera as an overview, but if you're also trying to identify faces, you might have to have a second camera to do the identification, which would actually have a much more zoomed in and higher resolution view, all right? So let's connect this camera now uh, to Archive VMS. All right, so I'm going to refresh my login just to be sure that my username and password have been changed from the default they have uh, let's now open archive so that we can verify in archive and connect in archive a 360 degree camera so i'm going to go to archive here I've, i have it running already i'm going to go to archive i'm logging into my own laptop so i'm going to be on archive of my own laptop the default username and password of my, uh, archive and also of my laptop is root root i'm just going to log in under root root i have not changed the default and then I will open up Archive. And the next thing I'm going to try to do, or I will do, will be to search and find that camera 
and connect it inside of Archive and then create a view or, or a usable user interface with a 360 degree camera. So first thing I'd like to do would be to go connect to this camera. So uh, inside of Archive you see I have a certain number of views, layouts inside. Well in this case here what I'm going to want to do is I'm going to go to the, uh, uh, the screwdriver and the wrench on the right hand side of the software, top right hand side of the software, and then click on devices. Devices inside of the devices menu inside of Archive is where we search for new devices and where we can con connect to new cameras. So in this case here, what I would like to do is I'm going to expand under my laptop uh, server and I'm going to go to add device. Now I do know the IP address of this camera. Um, but what I can do also is I could do a search inside of uh, Archive. Uh, it's faster though because I'm on Wi-Fi at the building here and it's going to look for all the cameras that we might have in a building and it maybe take a minute. Uh, but instead of this, I'm actually going to manually add this camera. Uh, I'm going to add this camera under uh, what we had decided, 192.168.1.108, 192.168.1.108. Uh, the vendor I will choose will be Onviv. Um, the Onviv driver is a generic driver that's available in the marketplace and most IP cameras uh, that are sold now uh, are uh, Onviv compliant. So if your camera is an Onviv compliant, just like this hemispheric 5 megapixel storm camera is, then it will connect with, uh, with Archive. There are more than 9,000 cameras that have been integrated with Archive from over 350 different manufacturers of cameras. So probably the camera that you're trying to connect is already integrated, and if not, then you can always uh, connect to it using the, the Onviv driver. Um, the username we said was admin, the password we said admin256. Um, it's asking me to bind to an archive, that's a hard drive, uh, or a, 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 um, I've defined where I would like on my hard drive to have recordings, um, so I'm going to bind to that archive that's on my, on my laptop. And it's asking me whether I want to record on motion, uh, always, uh, or not at all. So in my case here, I will actually record on motion. Uh, the ID is an automatically generated ID, it's a number, or I will myself choose a number for this camera. I'll let it be generated automatically. And the name can be generated automatically. It would simply call it camera with the next available number. So camera 12, 13, 14. In my case here, actually I already know what I want to call it. I'm going to call it 360 test because that's what I'm doing is a test on a 360 degree camera. I check my IP address, on if all is good, username and password is good, I click on plus and it will add that camera and automatically connect to the camera. So once this camera has been added, we see now in my list it's gone to uh, camera number 12, it's given it an ID of 12 and it's a 360 degree camera. Um, uh, so we see this in the list that has appeared now in the list. And if I come down a little bit in the, and we see that there's an image of the camera, so it's, it is streaming, it is connecting. If I, on the main page, if I come down a little bit and I go to the, the area where it says panamorph, panamorph. If I activate, this is activating that this camera is actually a 360 degree panamorphic or hemispheric camera. So I'm going to say yes. Then it asks me, what is the camera's position? Some of these uh, uh, panamorphic cameras are 180 degrees and they're wall mounted. In this case here, I'm going to say it is ceiling mounted. So ceiling mounted. And the lens type it has, over time, over the years, there have been many different lens types that have existed. Actually, if we take a look, I have more than 20 different lens types that are possible. Uh, in this case though, I know that the storm 5 megapixel hemispheric uses what is called a common fisheye lens um, and that's what I'm going to use as my choice. Okay? And then now if I press on apply, it will reconfigure uh, 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 the view of the camera to show that it's now a hemispheric camera and uh, if I go back to my viewing screen, so I go on the left here and choose to go back to live view, that's here. If I choose a layout, I choose to create a new layout. So creating a new layout is very simple. I go in this little Windows button here, I click on it, and create a new layout. I'm going to choose, because I want a layout with only one camera in it, I'm going to choose a layout of one camera, like this here, and then 
I will slide in, I expand my menu on the left, I slide in my camera called 360 test, and here is my 360 de degree view camera. If I take a look at the top here, I have the possibility of defining whether or not I want the low stream or the high stream. In this case here, I did not in the user interface of the camera activate the low stream. So I only have the possibility of, of uh, managing with the high stream. So I click on save. And it will now save this camera. Um, and if ever, I can hide my, my tree view. If ever I want to zoom in on the camera, I use the, the, the mouse, the scroll button on the mouse. So I simply zoom in on the scroll button on the mouse, and then we can, you know, turn, turn it around. We see here's Oleg, who's filming me. Um, we're in the training room of our office in, in, in Montreal here. Uh, say hello, Oleg, you're being filmed. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so if I come back out to 360 degree view, this is, this is how it's being recorded originally. And now when I zoom in, I can move it around like this. I can zoom in, you know, and take a look, you know, zoom into certain areas. Now, if you take a look at this, is a five megapixel camera. But if we just zoom in, for example, on Oleg, you'll know an Oleg is not that far from the camera. He's probably uh, maybe 10 feet, 12 feet, maybe four meters or so. Well, you see that Oleg's face is a little bit pixelated. Well, that's because this part of where I'm looking at really only has about one megapixel of usage uh, uh, pixels. In essence, really, is this whole field of view, the back, my, me, the top of my head, the screen behind me, all of that is also being viewed and recorded at the same time. So Oleg really only occupies a small space inside of the 360 degree view. So it's absolutely normal that when I zoom in directly on Oleg's face that it be pixelated. Because I'm zooming in, I'm doing a zoom in on something that's actually less than one megapixel, the camera. And that's why you'll have some pixelation, okay? Um, Let's also take a look, Oleg, I don't know if you, you mind, can you walk up to the wall over there, is that okay? So we can take a look, see what it looks like uh, about maybe 20 feet or so away. So we can see what it looks like 20 feet away. So stand next to the light switches over there, for example. So there's Oleg standing next to the light switch. And you see that 20 feet away, it's quite a bit pixelated, quite a bit more pixelated, even maybe at the pixelation you would expect maybe from a camera below one megapixel, let's say. And that actually is the resolution at that area is probably a little bit below one megapixel, the resolution on Oleg, at 20 feet away, for example. Uh, Oleg, if you don't mind, turn the lights off. And let's take a look to see what view you might have with this. It might not see me very well, but what view you might have uh, from this camera, but with the nighttime. And you'll see that it affects also the resolution. Light makes a big difference when we're talking about hemispheric cameras. So we're going to turn the, ca the lights off, all of them, this one too. It won't take long that the infrareds are going to turn on on the cameras and the camera image is going to turn into black and white. There we go, okay? So now it's turning in black and white and adjusting. Uh, you see some blooming in the middle there? It's because we have another camera there that has infrareds also, that's infrareds. But now if we take a look at Oleg as he's approaching, we're taking a look at Oleg, well it's quite pixelated because we are right now completely in the dark. And the only thing that's illuminating the scene right now is the infrareds from the camera is illuminating the scene. But you see that light matters a lot also when we're talking about hemispheric cameras. Uh, you know, the amount of light being accumulated on the sensor inside the camera is 360 degrees. Uh, so it's a single sensor of 360 degrees. So it requires a lot of light to be able to have a usable image also. So if you want to turn the, the lights back on, Oleg, um, I think that would, it shows exactly what we can do with a 360 degree camera, uh, what you can expect, it's going to turn back in color, what you can expect as image quality based on the resolutions, uh, you know, now Oleg color came back and we see a little bit better the resolution, but you're going to be able to see clearly exactly what we expect and uh, what, you can, what you can see. Um, and then, you know, maybe you, you use a 360 degree hemispheric as an overview camera, Perhaps you go with a higher resolution than five megapixels. So we also make 
uh, 6 megapixel and 12 megapixel hemispheric cameras. So in this case here, maybe a higher resolution camera, if you're looking at long distances, would be better for uh, a hemispheric camera. And also, if what you're looking to do is identification, and that's the most important point, if what you're looking to do is identification of the subject, uh, unless the subject is very close to a hemispheric camera, you're probably going to have to add a second camera of higher resolution with a, a much smaller field of view that is looking directly at the user. So I'd like to remind everybody that Inaxis is a, a, a manufacturer slash uh, distributor of uh, access control alarm video recording servers, switches, uh, network communications, power equipment. Uh, and we are absolute experts in all of these subjects. So, uh, you know, we sell our products into many companies, in many countries, in Europe, in North America, etc. cetera. Um, so we're experts. Call on us if you need help. We're there for that. Um, and we have all of these videos to try to help you, help you better sell, help you better understand our products. It, 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 that's why we're there. So call on us, don't hesitate. Uh, it's what we like to do. We have 12 salespeople in Canada alone that are there just to help you guys. So uh, don't hesitate, www.inaxis.com, sales at inaxis.com, and someone will contact you and we will be there to help you. Thank you.